Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome to MOS at Home. Today, we are going to be uh, taking this opportunity as the Earth completes another orbit around the sun to talk a little bit about how the Earth moves, about this uh, period of time we call a day, this period of time we call a year, and what exactly that means. My name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm going to be doing most of the talking uh, today, but I can't do this by myself. I have a partner in crime. Hi, everyone. Happy New Year. My name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and today I'm going to be flying you through space. And we're going to be using a program called Worldwide Telescope to do this. So Katie, go ahead and take us into space. So this is hopefully a uh, not unfamiliar view, a view of Earth rotating in space against the background stars. And obviously not all of Earth is facing the sun at the same time. Part of the Earth is facing the sun, part of the Earth is facing um, the away from the sun, so it's nighttime. And that also means that different parts of the earth are experiencing midnight at different times. In case you're wondering why, when you woke up this morning, folks in Sydney and Tokyo were already celebrating the coming of 2021. It has to do with the fact that it's not the same time on all of earth at the same moment. So to sort of help uh, codify that, we humans broke the earth up into time zones. So here is a map of time zones across the world. Uh, there's um, different, so it's different times, different times of the year. We on the east coast of the United States live over here in the, what we call the eastern time zone. Um, but that means that when it's, you know, midnight over in Tokyo, it's not midnight anywhere else. And this means we actually experience the new year at different points throughout the day. And so I'm going to share another slide. This one is centered on not on the Atlantic, like the last one was, but on the Pacific, because this is where the day officially starts. This line right here that runs between um, Russia and Alaska and down through the Pacific. It takes a bit of a jag to take in a few islands over here. And this is the point where the day begins. If it's, um, if it's 11 o'clock at night on December 31st over here, then it is 12 o'clock in the morning on January 1st over here. This is what we call the international dateline. And so the places that are near the dateline, they're the first part of the earth to experience uh, the day, which means they're also the first part of the earth to experience the new year. So I know Wellington, New Zealand likes to um, brag that it's the first city to see the new year. Um, there are lands that see it before Wellington, but Wellington is uh, the first big city. And that means that by the time you woke up this morning, assuming you are in the United States, it had already passed midnight uh, in Sydney, Australia, in Tokyo, moving uh, eastward, more and more places have celebrated New Year before you even woke up. So this is why we experience um, midnight at different times of the day. And it's why the United States is actually amongst the last places in the world to celebrate the New Year. So by the time we get around to celebrating uh, the coming of 2021, the finally ending of 2020, and the coming of 2021, uh, pretty much the entire rest of the world has already celebrated it. So um, we are amongst the last to do so. And again, that's a human designation. There's no reason why the day has to start there in the International Dateline in the middle of the Pacific. That's a human decision. Um, but it's worked out for us for quite a while, so we're going to keep going with that. But enough of, you know, looking at maps. Let's go ahead and actually look at our beautiful Earth in space. Here it is. It is um, spinning in space. We are looking at um, our planet. I never get enough of looking at our planet in space. And 
this is of course the beginning of the new year. So we've celebrated, we're celebrating New Year's Eve and New Year's Day uh, as the earth is spinning. That is called rotation. So you may have heard of revolution and rotation. Rotation is the spinning of the earth. And just to give you an idea, you know, when you're standing on the earth, you can't really feel yourself moving, right? You don't, as we're on the earth right now, you don't really feel it moving, but it's actually moving very, very quickly. And it spins actually at different speeds depending on how far north or how far south you are. So the place that the earth spins fastest is right at the equator. If you're on the equator, you're moving at about a thousand miles an hour just from the earth spinning. If you're standing near the pole, you're not moving very quickly at all. Think about it takes you, if you're standing on the pole, it takes you a full 24 hours just to turn all the way around once. You're moving very slowly. But if you're at the equator, like I said, you're whipping around at around a thousand miles per hour. And this is actually something that um, space companies, space people who send rockets into space like to take advantage of. That's why, for instance, when we launch rockets here in the United States, we launch them from Florida and not Maine because Florida is closer to the equator, Florida is actually moving a bit faster than Maine is. And that means it actually gives the rocket an extra bit of free momentum, which is good because if a rocket doesn't go fast enough, it doesn't make it into space. So we get to sort of steal a little bit of extra momentum from the earth itself by launching as close to the equator as we can get. And most major space companies have launch sites as close to the equator as they can get. Not all, but a lot. And just in case you're wondering how fast we're moving here in New England, it's obviously not a thousand miles an hour because we're not at the equator, but we're still moving over 700 miles per hour. So you're definitely getting your steps in, even if you're not moving. So that is how the earth is spinning. And that is how we can celebrate New Year's Day. That is a day. But when we're talking about New Year's, there's a different type of movement that we're really more concerned with. And that is the orbit of the earth around the sun. So we call this movement revolution. The earth revolves around the sun, or you can just say that it orbits. So we're going to pull back a little bit and we're going to look at the orbit of the Earth around the sun. So here is our solar system. You can see the sun in the middle there. And the great thing about this program is we can actually bump the sizes of the planets up so that you can see them a little easier so that you can get a better view of the Earth. So it's right where that crosshair is. And the orbit of the Earth is not actually a circle. Usually when you see drawings of the solar system, the orbits of the planets are drawn as circles. They're actually not. They're pretty round, but they're not perfect circles. They're actually what we call ellipses, which means kind of oval shaped. But most of them are pretty close to being a circle and that includes the Earth. But since it is an oval, that means it's actually closer to the sun at some points in its orbit than it is at others. And you might be thinking, well, it must be closest to the sun in like July, because that's when it's hottest, right? Certainly here in Boston, July is no joke. But it turns out how hot it is doesn't actually really have to do with how close we are to the sun. The difference between our closest point or perihelion and our farthest away point or aphelion is not enough to make a difference in the temperature of our planet. And actually the place that we are closest to the sun, the point in Earth's orbit when we are closest to the sun comes in early January when it is really, really cold here in New England. It's really hot in the Southern hemisphere. That's when they're celebrating summer but for here, for here in um, the Northern Hemisphere, 
it is very, very cold when we are close to the sun. This year, perihelion is coming on January 2nd, so the day after New Year's. And once again, it's kind of an arbitrary place. There's nothing special, particularly about where the Earth is on January 1st to make it seem that's obvious that that has to be the new year. You might say, well, perihelion's on the 2nd, but it's not always on the 2nd. Sometimes it's on the 6th of January. So it's always right around New Year's, but there's nothing particularly special about the place that the Earth is on January 1st. That means it has to be the place where we start the new year. It's not where the sun, where we're closest to the sun. It's not when the Northern Hemisphere has its shortest day. That was back on December 21st. We call that the winter solstice. It's the first day of winter. It's really not a particularly interesting point in the orbit at all. Just like humans sort of arbitrarily picked where on the earth would get to experience day first, the beginning of the new day, we also kind of arbitrarily picked the spot in the orbit that is going to get to be the beginning of the new year. So this orbit is completed almost. The thing is, the Earth doesn't quite take the same amount of time to complete an orbit as we measure as a year. It's almost exact. The Earth does take 365 days to orbit the sun, but not just 365 days, 365 and one quarter days. That's how long it takes the Earth to go around the sun. That's a little messy. We don't want to have quarter days on our calendar. So we solve this problem with leap years. This is why every four years, February has 29 days instead of 28. It's because over the course of four years, we've built up an extra day in our orbit that we need to account for because it actually takes the Earth 365 and a quarter days to go around the sun. That is one orbit or one revolution. And once again, the Earth is actually moving a whole heck of a lot faster than you think it is. I should also mention actually before we move on that um, it's not just leap days that we have to deal with. Of course, every four years, we do add a leap day, February 29th, to our calendar. We did have one in 2020. So our next one is going to be in 2024. But we also occasionally have to add leap seconds to our, to our day on December 31st, or even leap minutes. Because human timekeeping, the way we divide up time, doesn't quite perfectly match the way the Earth spins or the way Earth moves around the sun. They're close. They're very close, but they're not quite perfect, which is why we occasionally have to add those extra little bits of time just to make everything even out in the end. Now, I mentioned that before how fast Earth spins, how if you are standing on the equator of the Earth, the spinning of the Earth means you're moving at a thousand miles an hour. But if you're up at the pole, the spinning of the Earth means you're barely moving at all. So how fast you move because of the Earth's spin depends on where you are. How fast you're moving through space because of the Earth's orbit applies to everyone on the planet. And you are moving very, very quickly. You thought a thousand miles per hour was fast get ready for some much bigger numbers. So the circumference of Earth's orbit, so the distance around Earth's orbit, how much distance Earth has to move in order to complete the orbit is 585 million miles. I'm gonna say that again, 585 million. That's the distance that Earth has to cover every year. You might notice that's more than a million miles a day. It's actually about 1.6 million miles a day. So in order to cover that much distance in a single day, Earth is really whipping through space. It's actually moving about 67 
thousand miles per hour in its orbit around the sun. So everybody on earth, no matter where on earth they are, is moving around the sun at about 67,000 miles per hour. So you're actually, even when you're holding still, you're moving really, really fast. You just can't feel it. So this is, um, it takes 365 and a quarter Earth days for Earth to complete its year and for us to say we've completed an orbit, it's time to celebrate New Year's again. That is what Earth, Earthlings, us, that is what we call a year. But of course, what you call a year is arbitrary. It depends on where you are in the solar system. So yeah, on Earth, a day is 24 hours long and a year is about 365 days long. But of course, that's not true other places in the solar system. Everywhere is moving differently around the sun. So for instance, it, we celebrate a, a new year every 365 days. If you were on Mercury, the closest planet to the sun, you would have a new year every 88 Earth days. And I say 88 Earth days because it would only be every like one and a half Mercury days. Mercury actually orbits or rotates pretty slowly. So an, a day on Mercury is 59 Earth days long, but a year on Mercury is 88 Earth days long, which means by the time we're celebrating our new year, uh, Mercury has orbited about four times. So you'd be four times as old as you are now if you lived on Mercury. And the, so that's when, you know, a, the planet closest to the sun, Venus also has a shorter year than Earth does because it's closer to the sun than we are. Venus's year is 225 Earth days. So still shorter than ours, but a lot longer than Mercury's. Now, of course, if you go out farther from the sun, than where Earth is, things start moving slower. And the next planet out from us, of course, is the planet Mars. Mars actually takes about two Earth years to orbit the sun once. So one Martian year is about two Earth years. It's not exact, but it's pretty close. So when we specify how long our Martian spacecraft, for instance, have been either in orbit around Mars or on the surface of Mars. We usually express it in Earth years. Sometimes, though, we express it in Mars years, which means uh, if you lived on Mars instead of on Earth, you would only be half as old as you are now. And you'd have to go over 600 days in between celebrating New Year's. So and of course, those are that's just the inner solar system. We might think of that as being really, really far from the sun. You know, we think of Earth. Earth is 93 million miles from the sun. To an Earthling, used to thinking about distances the way we use them on Earth, 93 million miles is a ridiculous distance away. And Mars is even farther. Mars is like 150 million miles from the sun, give or take. So that's really far, right? Well, yes and no. That's the inner solar system. Let's go pull out just a little bit farther and take a look at the outer solar system. Starting with, uh, we can start with our my two favorite gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, which you can still, uh, you might've been able to see in the night sky. They came very close to each other in the night sky back in late December. Um, they're setting kind of with the sun right now. It's not a great time to necessarily go look for them, but right around December 21st, they were very, very close to each other in the sky. If you still want, you can still try and spot them in the night sky. You have to look very close after sunset. They're still very close together, although they are starting to move apart again. And they orbit at much, much greater distances from the sun than the Earth does, or even Mars. You can see, even on this scale, how closely clustered together those planets of the inner solar system look. 
and Jupiter, which is the innermost of those gas giant outer worlds, is orbiting at about 500 million miles away from the sun. So roughly five times as far away from the sun as Earth is. And that means it's got a much longer year. It's got actually a shorter day. Jupiter's day is only about 10 hours long, but its year is about 12 and a half Earth years long. So one Jovian year is 12 and a half Earth years. That is pretty impressive. I'd only be a couple years old if I lived on Jupiter. And of course, the farther out you go, the more extreme these numbers get. Saturn is twice as far from the sun as Jupiter is. It's almost a billion miles away from the sun. And it actually takes over twice as long to orbit. One Saturn here was, is about 29 and a half Earth years. So it takes almost 30 Earth years for Saturn to go around the sun once. And that's why it was very exciting, for instance, when we could put a mission long term in orbit around Saturn. Say we want to observe Mars over the course of a few seasons. It only needs, we'd only need to put a spacecraft in orbit around it for two years, two Earth years, and we'd get a full Martian year. We'd get to see Mars in all four of its seasons. For a full Saturn year, we would need to have a spacecraft in orbit for 30 years. And that is a trick we did not manage, but we did manage to keep a spacecraft in orbit for 13 years. Its name is Cassini. I mention it because it's my all time favorite space mission. And one of the great things about that mission is that it got to observe Saturn over the course of almost two full seasons. <clears throat> So it can observe the way, it could observe the way the planet changed over the seasons. Because as you know, if you look at Earth, just look at Earth, how much they change over the course of a year, how much seasons affect these planets. So it was really exciting when we managed to keep Cassini in orbit around Saturn for 13 years to get to see almost half a year at Saturn. Because the farther out you go, the, these numbers keep getting crazier. I think I'm going to pull these off the top of my head. Uranus orbits every 84 years. And Neptune, I can't remember off the top of my head. It is over 100 years. Neptune's orbit is over 100 years. And of course, it wouldn't be fair to not talk about Pluto. Pluto, of course, is not a planet but it is still part of our solar system. It's this white orbit that you can see here. That sort of weird, crooked, egg-shaped one. That's Pluto. Pluto actually takes 248 years to orbit the sun once. That's Earth years, obviously. One Plutonian year is 248 Earth years, which does mean that Pluto was a planet officially for less than one full orbit, significantly less than one complete orbit around the sun. Now that is really, really far from the sun. But of course, that's not the as far as things get and still orbit the sun. You may or may not have heard of something called Planet Nine. This is a theoretical object. It's an object we have not found, um, but it's an object we have some indirect evidence for. So we think it might exist. It would be a large planet-sized object farther out than Pluto, quite a bit farther out. We think if Planet Nine exists, that its orbit may be 20,000 Earth years long. Now that's a theoretical object. But there's objects out here that we know have orbits that last for thousands of years. Comets. Long period comets can take thousands or tens of thousands of years to orbit the sun. For instance, back in the 90s, I remember when I was a kid, everybody got excited when the comet hale Bop lit up the night sky. That's our only chance to see that one. It's not coming back for another 5,000 years. 
And that's not an unusual orbit for one of these long period comets. But even those don't mark the edge. There's a group of objects. It's actually where the comets come from. It's called the Oort cloud. And it is so far out from the sun that light from the sun can actually take a couple of years to reach it, we think. We've never actually seen the Oort cloud. We know comets have to come from somewhere though, so we're pretty sure it's there. But these Oort cloud objects are so far from the sun that they would take hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of years to orbit the sun once. Imagine having an orbit that lasted for a million years years. You'd only have, it all would have only been 65 years ago that the dinosaurs were walking the earth. And these objects are really, really painfully far away from the sun, but they are still controlled by the sun's gravity, which means they're still part of our solar system, even though they take so painfully long to orbit. Now we are, this is the very outer edge of the solar system. Katie, let's go ahead and head back to earth to say our farewells. Here we are back at our home planet, which takes a mere 365.25 days to orbit the sun, 24 hours to spin. And over the course of the next 24 hours, you either already have or are going to celebrate the new year. So we really, we wish you a, a very happy, very safe new year. So um, thank you very much for joining us here at MOS at Home. We hope you have enjoyed this program. If you have, we ha we're here a lot. There's a lot of MOS at Home programming uh, happening. You can check that out on our website. Um, once again, everybody have a safe new year. Have a happy new year. We're all looking forward to 2021 and the hope that it is bringing us. So um, bye, everybody. And remember, science never stops. So don't ever stop asking questions. And we hope to see you back here in the future. So long.